Good morning, YouTube. This is Mr. David Pope, and this is a response to Wolfwing1 and his recent video about cults versus religions. A few semesters ago, I wrote the following essay, Narcissism and Religious Cults, for my general psychology course. This is a rather lengthy paper, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. In this essay, I will be looking at the effects of narcissism on modern religious cults. I will be disclosing a lot of information about how these cults actually operate and what actually goes on behind closed doors. It is my hope that by the end of this essay, the reader will be able to identify the typical warning signs of a cultic group and be able to stay as far away from them as possible. Narcissism According to the Mayo Clinic, the Narcissistic Personality Disorder, NPD, is defined as a mental disorder in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance and a deep need for admiration. People with NPD are typically seen as bullies. They need to have their own way. They tend to exaggerate their accomplishments to earn the praise of others. And they have a complete inability to consider the feelings, emotions, and needs of others around them. They often constantly belittle other people or disregard the ideas and talents of others in order to make themselves look better by comparison. Now, the Mayo Clinic seems to think that NPD is treatable if said treatment is conducted in a carefully controlled small group setting. But I see a major problem with this. A truly narcissistic person, and believing he is better than everybody else, which would quite naturally include the therapist involved, would tend to believe that there is absolutely nothing wrong with him even when confronted by the stream of victims that he has left in his wake. If he were to be convinced that he has his NPD, he may in fact be inclined to think that there is nothing wrong with being a narcissist. It is simply means that he is self-confident, and there is something wrong with everybody else around him. There is a very strong contrast between self-confidence and the narcissist's personality disorder. The Mayo Clinic staff provides this distinction. Narcissistic personality disorder crosses the border of healthy confidence and self-esteem into thinking so highly of yourself that you put yourself on a pedestal. In contrast, people who have healthy confidence and self-esteem don't value themselves more highly than they value others. In regards to religion, narcissism takes on a far more dangerous and frightening form. A religious leader suffering from MPD and therefore having an inflated sense of self and inability to regard the needs of others will tend to think that he has a special calling of God that he only answers to God, and that his church or group is the only one teaching the truth. These statements seem to be a recurring mantra of Christian-based religious cults that I have observed. Cultism by Modern Definition In order to truly understand the effects of a narcissistic leader on a religious cult, we need to define exactly what a cult is, as the definition has significantly changed in recent years. The earliest definition of a cult, which first appeared in France between the 15th and 16th centuries, used to denote a group of religious adherents with their own set of beliefs and rituals. For example, the Roman Empire was said to have a cult of Diana, or a cult of Jupiter. A later definition was that a cult was a small religious group that was separate and distinct from a larger, older parent group. By this definition, Christianity was a cult of Judaism. Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventists are cults of Christianity, and so forth. This has been the prevailing definition of cultism throughout history, and still tends to cause confusion as groups that are exposed as being cults by a modern definition use the older one as a defense. After all, they have said, if the definition of a cult is merely an alternate opinion or change in doctrine, isn't every religion in the world a cult in some fashion? For the modern definition of a cult, I will pull information from two primary sources. Margaret Singer, author of Cults in Our Myths, and Mary Schauliger, author of Twisted Scriptures. While a simple official definition of a cult cannot be found, I believe I have compiled enough information about the subject to create one that is suitable. A cult is a group of individuals with similar ideology led by a single identifiable charismatic or narcissistic leader, who exercises excessive control over his members using behavioral modification and or psychological manipulation. Of course, this definition is permeated with loaded language, and as such, a person may come to misunderstand exactly what I mean. Therefore, I shall delineate as follows. Group A single individual is not a cult. He is merely a single individual with his own unique ideology. But bear in mind that 
this individual can use the media or internet to gather a following for his ideology, and if so facto, he becomes a cult leader. Similar ideology. A cult need not be religious in nature. There are religious cults, political cults, business cults, paramilitary cults, educational cults, or any combination of these listed. Charismatic. Many times a narcissistic style cult leader will take painstaking efforts to cast this organization in a positive light in the local community. This is usually done in an effort to attract new members, keep authorities or cult watchdogs at distance, or both. Excessive control. The environment within a cult tends to be oppressive in nature. Members typically do not have free choice concerning their activities as this cult leaders control every aspect of their lives. How they live, what they say, who they associate with, and if members are allowed to do so, what kind of career or education they are allowed to have. Psychological manipulation. Cult members really do not have voluntary informed consent about the cult's activities. Cult leaders use a bewildering variety of unethical techniques to change a person's ideology and silence their critics. I shall explain such activities in the next section. Typical Operations of Modern Cults The typical operation of modern cults tend to follow certain distinct models. All cults do use one or more of these techniques in some fashion or another. A group does not need to use all these methods to be considered a cult. Recruitment Practices Cults need to disguise their actual intentions in order to convince unsuspecting victims to become involved with their activities. For example, the Church of Scientology lures people by offering free personality tests, which victims ultimately fail, at which time they are coerced into paying money for auditing. Other religious-based cults may use Bible studies, church centers, or sponsored public events, or simply use aggressive proselytization with organized recruitment drives in large areas. The prevailing attitude, this phrase was actually used by one particular cult, is that the end justify the means. Meaning that any effort made by the group to recruit new members is acceptable as long as the person ends up becoming a member of the group and is subscribing to its ideology. Isolation. A cult needs to protect its victims by removing all extraneous influences that may be present in a person's life. This includes everything from actual isolation from family members, friends, and co-workers, to denigration of all completing theories and information. The victim is left with the idea that his family and friends are trying to separate them from their church group, or even persecuting them for their beliefs. This may be present in the following distinctions in cultic groups. A live-in cult requires its members to actually reside on the premises and housing provided by the group. A live-out cult allows its members to reside in and work in areas beyond the control of the group, or some combination of the previous two types. Surrogate Family The victim is encouraged to cut off his own family members during the isolation phase out of the ever-present paranoia that they are allegedly trying to actively pull the cult member away from the group. The other cult members then step in to become the victim's new family. The cult leader, or local pastor or administrator, becomes a very real father figure and the other cult members become brothers or sisters. This becomes reinforced when members are encouraged to think of themselves as a family and address each other as such. This becomes more pronounced if the victim has a history of family trouble, such as abuse or neglect, in which case the cult does in fact represent what a family environment is supposed to be. Now, this does not include legitimate church groups that use terms such as brother or sister in a friendly and formal group sense. This also does not include formal religious titles such as father, reverend, rabbi, or guru, even if some of these terms have family-oriented origins by etymology. Remember that a normal religious or social group sees themselves as an addition to the member's family or social structure, whereas a cult seeks to be a replacement of the member's entire family and social life. Information Control this refers to the indoctrination practices of the cult, wherein the group attempts to funnel all information that the victim receives. This is also present when a member is allowed access to outside information, but such information is highly censored, or the group exercises enough mental control that the member's opinion of the information is almost predetermined according to the group's ideology. 
In other words, just like isolation techniques, all outside information authorities and ideology is immediately suspect and seen to be a negative influence to try to force a member to abandon the cult's beliefs and practices. Mind Control Once isolation, surrogate family, and information control techniques are in use, the cult then attempts to change the individual's thought process by means of a variety of different manipulative techniques. This may be paramilitary in orientation where the group uses sleep deprivation, starvation, or physical force to wear down a person's will. Or, particularly in the case of live-out cults, the techniques tend to be more psychological in nature, notably in groups that use hatred, intolerance, or fundamentalist ideology in a very controlled and authoritative environment. One must not think that mind control techniques come in the form seen in the movies or television. Cults are not using electromechanical devices strapped to people's heads to get them to conform to the group's will. The actual techniques are far more subtle in nature, as group attempts to slowly change a person's mental outlook, outward appearance, and overt personality traits. This is when a cult member is seen to become, quote, insane, as the group imposes its own accepted ideology and personality traits upon the victim, and he has to suppress his own desires, talents, ideas, and personality to conform to the group's desires. This ultimately leads to the next step. Behavioral Control Once the victim has rejected all outside influences and accepted the cult's ideology, he becomes sufficiently suggestible to any action that the cult requires of him. Usually, the action is relatively benign work a 40-hour job to provide a portion of the money to the cult, engage in recruiting efforts, attend all required group activities and meetings, etc. But sometimes the behavior control becomes significantly dangerous. Drink this punch, kill this person, assassinate this world leader, fly this airliner into this building, etc. Bear in mind that, despite all evidence to the contrary, this person is not conducting such action of his own free will, but under the influence of systematic psychological conditioning by which he will ultimately believe that what he is doing is right. It all depends on the personal beliefs of the cult leader. Pastoral Authority The group leaders seem to have absolute authoritative control of the group. No competing opinions are allowed, no dissension permitted. With the concept of pastoral authority, which is loosely based on extreme misinterpretation of biblical scripture, the cult leader can simply create his own doctrines or dogmas and expect his members to follow it, no matter how absurd the teachings may be. Remember that in a cult, the leader is always very highly esteemed by the members, no matter what the public or social perception of the group may be. Absolute Cult Dependency Somewhere along the course of these techniques, a cult member will eventually become completely dependent upon the cult for his very survival. This is particularly troublesome in live-in cults, where the member finds that he will not have the resources to live without the assistance of the cult. Even in live-out cults, the group still has such a stranglehold on its members that they cannot see any viable way out. Even if the victim really does want to leave the group, he does not know where to go or what resources may be available to him. They find it easier just to stay with the cult and appear to agree with his practices and beliefs, even though he doesn't really believe it. This is why many cults appear to be voluntary in nature, when in reality, they are not. Some groups even goad their members, saying such things as, If you don't agree, there's a door! You can leave any time you want! The cold, hard reality is that they are so dependent upon the cult that they cannot leave even if they want to. Fortunately, some former members do escape and tell the story in the following section. Escaping from the cult Make no mistake about it, escape is the most appropriate word to describe extraction from a cult. Some concerned family members have used less than legal tactics to regain access to the lost loved ones, such as kidnapping and deprogramming, which of course presents many ethical and legal problems. Usually it backfires, because as previously stated, it plays into the idea that other people outside the group, including family members, are actively trying to persecute them and pull them out of the group. The only, and this is not a superlative, the only effective legal method of extracting a cult member is to convince a member to leave on their own. Essentially, the goal is to reverse the systematic cult techniques employed by the group. But that process in and of itself is very difficult, time-consuming, and leaves the individual with significant psychological damage. Some of the issues involved are as follows. Identity Crisis 
Since the cult has controlled so much of victims' lives, thought process, behavior, and ideology, the person is usually left in a state of general identity confusion. This is most prominent in the presence of the pseudo-personality or the system of personality traits imposed upon him by the psychological manipulation of the cult. According to Margaret Singer, a former cult member will gradually return to his former outlook and personality traits that he held before his involvement in the cult, but without suitable psychological counseling, the process could take years to accomplish or may never happen at all. Many former cult members become so confused and disillusioned that they end up committing suicide. Theological Confusion Unlike other forms of political or sociological ideologies which may be accepted or rejected without undue permanent damage to one's psyche, theological ideology alone holds qualification of dealing with metaphysical issues that are deemed to be essential to the religious standing of one's eternal soul. A person who truly believes in deeply held theological concepts cannot simply shuck these off just because he leaves his old church. A former cult member must come to terms with this new religious ideology once he is no longer under the psychological manipulation of the cult. Theological confusion seems to be found in three basic types in no certain order of importance. Complete rejection. This means that the former cult member absolutely rejects all of the theological teachings of the group. This can be seen to be throwing out the baby with the bathwater, because when the victim rejects the cult's theology, he may also inadvertently reject what is actually sound scriptural doctrine. This person will likely to reject all forms of religious experiences and may become atheistic or agnostic. Complete Acceptance A former cult member may accept most of the group's teachings but not like the practices or activities of the group. As he continues in his personal religious studies, he will tend to read the scriptures and other religious materials with the psychological mindset of the group, which in turn will continue to reinforce the condition theological acceptance according to the group's teachings. This person will have a high propensity of returning to the cult when he ultimately finds that no other churches are preaching the truth. Partial Acceptance or Rejection A mature religious person of reasonable intelligence and researchability will eventually realize that the former cult had, in fact, taught some things that were correct, while simultaneously they taught some things that were wrong. This person would be advised to simply change Bible versions and continue studies. Since most Bible-based cults teach the King James Version as the only acceptable translation of the Bible, for example, he could switch to the NIV or other version of the Bible. He would reconfirm his faith, be reinforced with sound religious doctrines that he already holds to be true, without the twisted doctrines taught by the cult. Believe it or not, this actually works. Cults base their aberrant doctrines upon the wording or even the punctuation that exists in established Bible versions. By switching Bible versions, the faulty doctrine no longer exists. Reintegration Much like prolees and discharged military personnel, a former cult member will have significant problems reintegrating with outside society. Many will have no job skills or problems finding or keeping a job. They will need to learn how to associate with individuals who do not share their beliefs or values. Many have problems returning to their family members outside of the cult, many of whom they have personally harmed by the cult's isolation control techniques. Luckily, former cult members find that their family members quite forgiving and accepting, especially when they find out exactly how the behavior was caused by the cult's manipulation. Making a clean break Few marriages survive escape from the cult, which becomes a mitigating factor in the ultimate decision to leave. When one person chooses to leave, the remaining spouse becomes under heavy pressure to divorce the one who leaves and be remarried to someone still in the cult who is seen to be more loyal. Occasionally, a husband and wife leave together. Apparently, a couple can decide that they love one another more than they love the cult. Even single people have trouble leaving the cult, as they have such an unhealthy dependence upon the cult that they do not see any viable means of support or survival away from the group. Even if they want to leave, there is tremendous pressure from the cult to make them stay. Obviously, the cult knows that they cannot legally force them to stay, even though some still try, but inevitably the group will use every mind control and psychologically coercive technique in their arsenal to stop the victim from leaving. Once a person does leave, cults tend to turn against their former members, outright rejecting them and fighting against them. Threats, coercion, and character assassination are very common. The bottom line is that cultic groups become very vindictive when it comes to former members who have inside information that may potentially harm them. Exit Counseling 
Psychologists and other counseling professionals find that they gently want to help people who have escaped from cults. However, both Singer and Schnalliger advise against such counseling techniques without specialized training in cult operations and manipulation techniques. Most tend to want to look at family environments and upbringing when they really ought to begin with the ideology of the group, whether the cult members has accepted or rejected such ideology, and what specific problems the victim has experienced with social reintegration. This is a very difficult process, but so is everything else in the psychology profession. Now, don't let me leave you with the idea that the issue of narcissism and cultic groups is nothing but a bunch of gloom and doom. There is light at the end of the tunnel. In addition to asset counseling, there are several church-sponsored and online support groups to assist victims of cultic manipulation to return to outside society. On the whole, former cult members exhibited an amazing capacity for survival and a willingness to return to the former ideological and social outlook. They will not allow the cult to continue to manipulate them. The internet, in particular, as I said, the place where religions come to die, provides tremendous opportunities to tell their stories and expose their former cult groups. Some of them have been able to challenge the cult groups in court and received sizable civil settlements, although such cases are relatively rare. Some groups have turned to art, music, literature, and education in order to tell their stories and avail to the public the message of the danger of distracted cultic groups. In the end, victims of cult groups can't survive. They will. They must. Thank you for watching.